So in this video, I'd like to explore a little bit more the issue of fundamental performance limitations. So in our introduction to feedback, uh, we identified this as our feedback loop. So again, G of S is the plant. Um, D of S is the controller that we'll design, both in the transfer function form. Um, we have our reference input, and we have our plant output. We have our control signal here, U, an air signal, E. We have a state disturbance, W, coming in, um, and a measurement noise, V, coming coming in, both of which can tend to disrupt the loop. Um, and so we identified the transfer functions um, from R to Y um, as being G of S, D of S over 1 plus G of S, D of S. And we argued that in a similar way you can unwind these uh, uh, block diagram uh, and uh, derive the transfer function as the forward gain over one minus the loop gain for any of these other trans several transfer functions here. And we saw that in so doing we introduced um, four transfer functions that are of interest um, and they commonly go by these names sensitivity, uh, S of S, complementary sensitivity, T of S, and uh, complementary sensitivity is just one minus the sensitivity. Um, the uh, control sensitivity, S U of S, and the output sensitivity, S I of S, and they're related to the transfer functions uh, from the various inputs to the various signals along this uh, path as shown there. Of course, T of S is also call sometimes called the closed loop transfer function because it's the transfer function from R to Y that you generally uh, care about uh, when you first uh, take a look at this system. So let's explore this a little bit further. So we've already noted that um, you can't do anything you want, specifically just looking at uh, T of S, um, plugging in S is equal to I omega, you can see that Y of I omega over R of I omega is equal to U of I omega um, over uh, W of I omega, sorry, with a minus sign there. Um, and so that implies that you can't simultaneously um, make the response at some frequency omega, the response of Y to R nearly one, meaning you have good tracking that whatever sinusoid putting, you're putting in, you get about the same sinusoid coming out, so you'd want this thing to be near one. You can't, can't simultaneously have that near one and at, have the same frequency have U of I omega respond not so much to W of I omega. And so we've got the possibility of state disturbances coming in there and we'd like U not to respond so much, but we can't have both. So at those frequencies omega where this is of order one, this we're stuck with being order one as well. So that's the first fundamental performance limitation that we see as a result of these. Here are a couple of others. Um, so taking a look at, uh, at these uh, other sensitivities, um, we can see that um, since the complementary sensitivity uh, and the sensitivity um, are related in a very simple way, um, we can plug in S is equal to I omega, um, and we can see that the transfer function from V to Y and the transfer function from V to U are uh, related to this way, so plug in S is equal to I omega again, and we see that we can't simultaneously get the response of Y to V to be small and the response of u to v to be small. And so one of these is one plus the other. Um, and so we would like u, the control input, not to respond so much to measurement noise. And we would like the output y to not respond so much to noise. But we ha can't have both um, because one is one plus the other. Um, and so if one is small, the other one is order one, vice versa. Finally, um, we can also um, see from the above relations that, um, from this one specifically, uh, that T over G is equal to D over one plus GD. So in other words, plugging in S is equal to I omega. Um, at those frequencies that we want good tracking, so if we want uh, T of I omega to be nearly one, so R of I omega is equal to Y of I omega, um, if the plant gain is small at those frequencies, so if G is a small number, the only way, the way that we can get one over a small number uh, out of this relation on the right is if D is a large number. So good tracking at frequencies that we have low plant gain requires large controller gain. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's generally a challenge. Um, so these are some fundamental performance limitations that we can start with. Um, and uh, so it's also useful 
um, to denote, uh, to, to take a look at a relationship um, between uh, these sensitivities. Um, and we see that um, we have um, our S of S and our T of S um, are related, sorry, our SI of S and our S of S are related such that SI of S um, is equal to um, S of S times G of S. And our uh, T of S um, is uh, equal to SU of S times G of S. Right, so T of S um, is just SU times G, um, and SI um, is just S of S times G. Right, um, And so we see that we have um, this relationships between two of the sensitivities here um, and between two of the sensitivities there by tacking on the G. Now we have this uh, additional concept which is called um, internal stability. So internal stability means simply that all four of these transfer functions are stable. So to begin with, you might temp be tempted to say, hey, stability means T of S is stable, right? And that's a good starting point. Um, so that means the Y doesn't blow up as long as the R doesn't blow up. Um, but um, in order for the interior signals not to get large, even if the output is, uh, is bounded, we want these other sensitivities to be small as well. So that's the concept of internal stability. Not only do we need T of S to be stable, but we need SU of S to be stable, S of S to be stable, and SI of S to be stable. So let's take a look at these relationships between these four sensitivities. Um, and Remember that G of S is a transfer function. So it's a rational function of S. It has poles and it has zeros. So looking at these two relationships and requiring that all four of these sensitivities um, are stable, we see that the poles and the zeros of G of S are going to come into um, either the poles or the zeros of these two sensitivities and the poles and the zeros of these two sensitivities. And so we have a couple of possibilities. So let's start by taking a look at this equation and let's begin by taking a look at what happens to the poles of G of S. So the poles of G of S are either canceled by a corresponding zero of S of S or it appears as a pole of SI of S. Straightforward enough. Um, if it is a zero of SI of S, it can be in the right half plane or left hand plane, and that's fine. Um, but if the um, pole of G of S is unstable, um, then um, it can't appear as a pole of SI of S because that has to be stable. So it's got to be canceled by a corresponding zero of S of S. So we can allow a pole of G of S to be either a zero of S of S or a pole of SI of S. Unless it's unstable, then it's got to appear as a zero of S of S. Similarly, um, the zeros of G of I of, I of uh, sorry, the zeros of G of S have got to be either uh, a pole of S of S, so there's a, a cancellation between a pole here and a zero there, um, or they will appear as a zero of, uh, of S I of S. And so, if the zero of G of S is in the right half plane, then it had better appear over here because it can't appear in the denominator here. So if the zero of G of S is stable. It'll either appear in S, in S of S in the denominator or in S of I, S I of S in the numerator. But if um, it's in the right half plane, it cannot appear in the denominator of S of S. It's got to appear in the numerator of S I of S. You can make a similar argument over here. So a G of S will have poles and zeros. And uh, so, for instance, if the G of S, um, if we take a look at the poles of that, uh, if the poles in the um, right half plane, then um, it has to appear as a zero of S U of S, but if uh, the, the pole of G of S is in the left half plane, then it can either appear as a zero of S U of S or um, as a pole of T of S. Um, similarly, a zero of G of S, um, if it's in the right half plane, 
has to appear over as a zero of t of s because we can't have s u of s to be uh, unstable. But if the zero of g of s is in the left half plane, it can either appear um, as a pole of s u of s or as a zero, a zero of t of s. So those are some relationships that you can get from the internal stability um, of uh, requiring that a system be internally stable um, leads to those relationships um, by taking a look um, at the interrelationships between the uh, between the four um, sensitivities that we are uh, interested in in such a problem. So. There's something else that we can look at, which is which is quite interesting. So again, um, for simplicity, I'm going to um, denote L of s um, simply as g of s d of s. Um, so I have to write less. Um, and so this sensitivity s of s, let me write it over here again, um, is just equal to uh, one plus one over one plus L of s. And um, so now what I'm going to do, uh, well, also let me define uh, the uh, um, relative degree. So if I have my L of s um, is equal to, let's say, some k times um, s to the m plus um, b m minus 1 s to the m minus 1 plus dot 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 all the way down to b1 s to the 1 plus b naught over s to the n plus b n minus 1 s n minus 1 plus all the way down to um, sorry, these are a's in the denominator, all the way down to um, a naught. Um, then we'll say the order of the denominator is n, and the order of the numerator is m. Um, then we'll call the relative degree n r of this expression l of s um, is n minus m. And if the relative degree is positive, it's strictly proper. If it's um, positive or zero, then it's proper. If it's exactly equal to zero, we call it semi-proper. Uh, and if nr is negative, we call it improper. And uh, so what we can do here then is we can take a look at an integral, which is quite interesting, um, which is the integral from zero to infinity of the log of the absolute value of this um, s, this sensitivity function, uh, evaluated s equals i omega, um, d omega. And it can be shown, and this is a difficult integral to perform, um, and it actually uses contour integration, um, and so this is not an easy integral to perform, but once you, uh, once you do, it can be shown that this is equal to um, some expression over here, we'll call it minus kappa times pi over two, where kappa um, is equal to uh, the limit as s goes to infinity uh, of s times L of s. And uh, so this is going to equal some, uh, some constant if, uh, if the relative degree uh, equals one, um, and it's going to equal zero if the relative degree is greater than one. So um, in the case that the relative degree is, say, two, um, this integral is exactly zero. Now that's, uh, the, the consequences of that are, are actually um, quite profound. And so let's take um, an example. Let's take L of s is equal to k over uh, s plus 10 um, times s plus 1. And so clearly the relative degree in this case is equal to 2, so it's strictly proper. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, take a look at the uh, the integrand here, um, the log of uh, the absolute value of this function s as a function of the frequency. And uh, so I'm going to take a look at um, ln of the absolute value of s of i omega as a function of the frequency omega. Um, and so here's the 
zero line, so that's um, ten to the zero if you don't have uh, if you don't have the log, um, and then you have uh, values below that and, and values above that, um, and since nr is equal to two, that means kappa is equal to zero. Um, and so what that means is that this integral is zero. And so um, if there is a, uh, if there is an area down below that has to be, let's say that, um, then, and if there is an area above, then the area below in blue plus the area above or minus the area above in pink has got to total zero. There's as much area down below as there is up above. And this is true no matter what L of S is. And so as you change D of S, you will change L of S. But this will remain true as long as the, the relative degree remains the same, which is phenomenal because that means that um, as you adjust things, you can adjust things with D of S as much as you like, but that integral is going to remain equal to zero, which means that if you push down the sensitivity someplace, it's going to pop up someplace else uh, in such a way that that integral remains zero. That's like often called the, uh, the waterbed effect. Um, if you push the waterbed down somewhere, it comes up somewhere else such that the total average remains constant. Um, and that's called Bode's integral theorem. And integral theorem. And that's one of the most uh, profound and perhaps elegant fundamental performance limitation um, that uh, you can, uh, because you're often worried about this sensitivity, the sensitivity is, sensitivity is obviously important, um, and so you would like to reduce it at some uh, frequencies where things can go wrong, uh, but you have to be careful that when you push it down someplace, it will pop up elsewhere, um, and so you have to be very careful, um, and uh, that is uh, what you have to do in this business. And so, to summarize all of these fundamental performance limitations, they lead to what I like to call a mantra of control design, uh, which is, um, do no harm. Only push a system as hard as you need to in order to meet the performance objectives. Don't put it, push it any harder than that because you see that every time you do more control than you need to, a problem pops up somewhere else. And so we're going to try to do what we need to as we do control design um, in, the, uh, in, in the coming videos. We're going to talk about how to tune a controller to meet the controller objectives, um, to meet rise time, settling time, and overshoot constraints on the step response of the closed loop system for example, but our goal will be don't push it any harder than you absolutely need to in order to get that job done because as you push it harder, problems crop up elsewhere. And so with that, we'll, uh, we'll conclude this discussion um, and next time we'll uh, begin to move on to controller design.